Hello, welcome to Cal Cairo's very first virtual vendor Friday with the Injury Institute. Thank you for joining us. For those that aren't familiar with the Injury Institute, it's a network of highly skilled physicians, surgeons, chiropractors, and other healthcare professionals who work on a lean basis. Uh, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A along with your email. Uh, and if we aren't able to get to them at the end, the Injury Institute or one of the doctors will contact you and, and to answer your question. Right now, I'd like to hand it over to today's host, Dr. Shadi Amin. Thank you so much, Nicole, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this virtual when vendor Friday with Cal Cairo and Injury Institute. I am very, very honored to be the host of this webinar. As Nicole mentioned, Injury Institute is a medical directory that's been in business for over 23 years with some of the most phenomenal marketing um, techniques out there. They do have uh, their very, very special um, directory that they have online virtual as well as in catalogs that I'm sure many of you may have seen and they have marketing both online web-based SEO social media marketing in-person marketing when we actually could do the seminars and conferences which is now shifted over but they have had the presence for many many years and they're the go-to standard in the industry currently right now for all the doctors that do provide care on a lean basis we will first have Dr. Sana Khan of Expert MRI. He is an MD, PhD graduate of UCI and UCLA, and he has built an advanced medical diagnostic um, centers all over Northern and Southern California with emphasis on accurate diagnosis with upright and kinetic MRIs. Then we will have Dr. Kevin Trin of Pacific Spine and Orthopedics. He is a double board certified pain management anesthesiology physician. He is a graduate of UCI and UCLA as well as Loma Linda University, and he's got extensive experience in interventional pain management. Following that, we will have Dr. Kenneth Light. He is an orthopedic spine surgeon, graduate um, of uh, Cornell University, uh, UC San Francisco, as well as State University of New York at Buffalo with locations both in Northern California, Southern California in LA, as well as Inland Empire. Last but not least, we have Dr. Sharif. She is a graduate of Southern California College of Optometry. She's in private practice, both in Tustin as well as is your Belinda, and she's an adjunct faculty member of Western Optometry, um, I'm sorry, Western College of Optometry. She is fellowship trained in neuro optometric rehabilitation and has extensive experience in evaluation and treatment of TBI cases. With that being said, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Khan, over to you. All right, <clears throat> all right, try to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go through some stuff pretty quickly. Uh, what I want to do is actually set up the stage uh, for the for the physicians that will be following me. Um, so, just to kind of you know, just kind of review some of these things which you guys pretty much already know, but it helps to be reminded that the average head weighs typically around ten pounds to twelve pounds, um, and so I was referred to as a bowling ball. Um, and if you ever lifted a ten pound bowling ball or twelve pound bowling ball, you know it's a pretty heavy. Uh, thing to lift. So this is what's happening. You have this bowling ball sitting in the top of a stick, which is the vertebral column. And when you have a whiplash injury, this bowling ball goes all different directions, depending on where the momentum takes it. So what happens is you get the injury in the in, in the spine, as well as, of course, this uh, traumatic brain injury that Dr. Sharif is going to talk about a little bit more at the end. Uh, but in terms of the trauma to the spine, uh, often, you know, we see disc herniations, disc injuries, we see, we see ligamentous damage uh, and facet joint issues. So that's depending on, again, the momentum, the speed, what's happening, the different damages occur. So often people really focus in on disc herniations. And there's nothing wrong with that, but when you talk to PI attorneys and, and, and even workers' comp attorneys, um, med legal attorneys, their big thing is, oh my God, the disc size, oh, this is a six millimeter disc, it's a three millimeter, it's an eight millimeter, and they get really excited about it. Um, and I've been treat teaching a lot of them in the last 90 days um, that it's good to be concerned about the disc, but there are other things that exist in the spinal canal, uh, you know, like the spinal cord, for, for example. Uh, and then um, there's other structures, uh, including lots of vasculature that exists, you know, and, and Dr. Light will talk about it from a 
spinal surgeon's perspective. But just to give you guys a visual, right? From the left one, I see the spinal cord. If you look at the right, you can actually see the complicated vasculature in the middle. At the very right, you see that there's actually tiny little vessels that actually are going in. You have spinal arteries there. Uh, you, got the retrieval, you got the discs being supplied by capillaries from the bone above and below, but they're really thin vessels. So when there's injuries and whiplash, all of these structures are involved and we can't just get fooled into thinking that it's just the disc that we should be worried about. Uh, two main things that allow motion in the spine. Um, one is the disc itself, that level. And again, every, people think about the disc all the time uh, in the medieval world, but often the facet joints, which is another area, that's another unit that has motion involved, uh, is, is, is very important as well. And it's a small joint. So injuries to there, um, in, in terms of imaging and MRIs wise, they're, they're difficult to capture. Um, just so you know, I am really working on it as, as a project for myself to be able to look at inflammation in the, in the facet joints, uh, if and when they occur, very specifically with our 3T MRI machines. So I'll have something hopefully out soon that can evaluate it better. But right now, uh, it's, it's tough to do. So that's where, um, as Dr. Amin will be talking about uh, the pain management injections and things of that nature uh, in a little bit to you. So just keep in mind, there are two main areas that allow for motion, the disc itself and the facet joints in the back. Now this is, don't try to read this please, uh, <laughs> but this is from the AMA guides uh, for the evaluation of permanent impairment. And what I'm trying to highlight to you are, are these with these arrows with the middle column actually talking about radiculopathy lands you in a DRE category three for the AMA guides, which is 10 to 13% impairment rating. Typically from the disc herniation, right? That's touching the nerve root or something to that effect. It's causing radiculopathy, either that or with, with chemical releases and things of that nature. What's important to understand here in this particular table is that if you look at category four and five, those are really high double or more ratings from the AMA based on instability. So the AMA actually talks about instability in a much more significant fashion than it talks about radiculopathy, okay? That's because when you have damage to the, to, to the um, ligaments, right? That's there, and, and again, probably Dr. Light can hit on it more, where you have this instability, you have long-term consequences of instability uh, at that level or those levels, okay? So if you, if you look at the middle picture, so the left picture kind of shows you when there's tearing of the interspinous ligaments. Uh, the right side picture actually shows you something interesting, right? On a recumbent scan, on a recumbent MRI, it would have been kind of tough for me to call that as interspinous ligamentous tear. Uh, but when we image the patient in the position that's causing their symptoms or their instability, in this case, it was upright flexion MRI, you can actually see the tears fairly readily. Um, if you look at the right picture, where it said, it's, and I'll give you a quote from the AMA guides from page, uh, I think 384 or 378, where it says the dominant motions of both the lower cervical and the entire lumbar spine, where most clinical pathology occurs are flexion and extension. So if you're not doing flexion and extension imaging, you're actually missing most of the clinical pathology on the patient. And you can see that pretty clearly on the image itself. Neutral exam would not have shown you the inst instability at L4, L5 that we can see with the standing flexion image. Uh, so the design of this machine, of course, front to open, so you can actually see, uh, you know, the patient sitting, standing, full flexion, full extension, full range of motion. Uh, and sometimes the argument can be made that, you know, look, we want a really high field Tesla magnet, and I agree with that because I have those two. But in this kind of a situation, I would have gotten a sharper image of a normal looking spine. What's the point of that when the actual imaging, the actual pathology is occurring with standing and flexion position? So, so I prefer the, these kind of imaging for when it comes to musculoskeletal. Uh, and this is last but not least of the slides, basically talking about the facet joints and the facet joints are very important as I said earlier, and you can see inflammation in these joints and these, these can get damaged in whiplash hard to image, uh, but then doctors uh, have other ways of figuring out what's happening at the facet joints and the facet disease. And having said that, I will hand it over to Dr. Amin for the next segment. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. So currently right now, it would be Dr. Kevin Trin, the pain management physician who would go on. I work with Dr. Trin side by side at Pacific Spine and Orthopedics. I am a chiropractor by trade. Um, I have been doing um, work with personal injury for many, many years and have seen multiples of times, not just in personal injury, where we do treat patients on a chiropractic basis and afterwards the MRIs are done and we reach a point after about six weeks of treatment that we realize we're kind of reaching a plateau, the patient still has some ridiculous symptoms or localized symptoms that kind of get worse with extension. I do have Dr. Trin's um, PowerPoint presentation from a webinar he did yesterday, but along of what you what you were discussing, Dr. Khan, um, Dr. Trin and all other pain management doctors, really their point of assessment of the patient is to see how they can aid this patient's recovery and further progressing with involving interventional pain management, obviously, with the form of injections. Now, that can come either in the form of um, epidural injections, and I'm gonna just show like a slide over here, and I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I don't know if this is gonna come up really right now, but I will try. This is, um, what uh, Dr. Trin utilized actually yesterday um, when we were doing um, our webinar yesterday. So this is a picture and I'm gonna just change the view here so you can see um, what we're discussing. And I apologize, there's the reading view. And there we go. So Dr. Trin would be assessing whether the um, area, the point of the pain is basically coming from a disc herniation with um, pressure on nerve roots that's causing a ridiculous symptom, or um, is it localized pain mostly coming from the facet joints, which will be assessed with what they do usually is palpation of the facet joints. There's usually localized pain that increases upon palpation. With extension, typically the pain gets increased. Um, and so important here to see if there's a disc herniation that's putting pressure on the nerve root, the cervical epidural, and this is something that's come up in the past with the pain management doctors in our group, is usually done for safety purposes at C7, T1. The area of the epidural space at this level is the widest, and so there is the least amount of possible risk of puncturing the um, cervical cord and getting that leak that you guys may have heard of or had patients that have experienced it that will then cause the severe headaches that the patients have and potentially lead into having to have a blood patch afterwards. So that's one of the things that they do and they do do this at C7, T1. This comes up a lot, but that's what's the recommended level for pain management physicians. And you can see this is one that Dr. Trin had done just recently, uh, two days ago. And it's a picture of the needle you can see under the fluoroscope unit that they had done the injection. Um, facet joint pain, as Dr. Khan was describing, is the uh, pain being generated from the facet joints at the back of the spine. And what's interesting is Dr. Trin utilizes this diagram, and I thought it was so fantastic, because you can get those symptoms with the radiculopathy kind of going with the radiation into the upper shoulder or the mid back, which most of us would look at that and think, oh, this must be a disc herniation with kind of a pressure on the nerve root, but it can mimic that as well. And so this is the facet joints. You can see it's highlighted there in red. That's where the injection is done. Understand that the nerve roots basically will go above and below. So the injections will be done at two levels above and below on where they're having the facet mediate, mediated pain. And this is a picture that you can see the needles on the right side pretty much. That's, the doctor actually did this injection just about two days ago. Again, these are all recent pictures of procedures he had just done. Um, and then, of course, uh, these procedures can also be done for the lumbar spine. Um, they do a transferaminal procedure for the epidural of the lumbar spine. Dr. Chen uh, does that in Dr. Yoon as part of our group. And everything is done under a fluoroscopic unit. The medications that use they use is a mixture of FDA-approved herbal medications along with steroids. So they have a little bit of a different technique here at this facility, our pain management doctors, where they do the combination and there's less of the side effects of the steroid use basically when they do that. And that's the picture that you can see. And then lumbar facet pain, again, what's interesting about this, 
for me as a Cairo was, oh, wow, you can actually get that ridiculous symptom, even with facet generated pain. As you can see, the distribution here, it does go down. It doesn't necessarily go down all the way to the bottom of the foot, as Dr. Trin explains, but you can get the ridiculous symptoms with that as well. And as you can see, what's red on this picture is where the medial branch facets, uh, the medial branch nerve roots are, and that's where they do the blocks. And here's a picture of a procedure the doc just recently did. And we don't really need to cover that, but this is what I was discussing with you guys. They use what's called uh, seraphin. It's an FDA approved herbal medication that doesn't have the side effects of steroids. And they mix this with basically pure dexamethasone, which is a steroid, and they do the injections. And at this facility, our doctors are very anti-narcotics, so they try to treat the patients very, very holistic-based. And of course, if that does not help the patient, then it gets transferred over to a spine surgeon, whether it be a neurosurgeon or orthopedic spine surgeon for the recommendations on whether the patient will need surgical intervention. And and I appreciate you guys letting me go over the slides of Dr. Trin with you, even though um, that's not my specialty. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Light. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> you could be a pain management. So. Oh, I Thank you. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Light. Up to you. Okay. Well, um, that's fantastic. I enjoyed both of those talks. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to get my slides onto this. So, Shadi, go go down and 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 get stop the stop the slide share yourself. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Light will then be able to share his. There we go. Okay. So, Dr. Light, you can go down and and where it says green button for share screen. I did. You see that? Let's there see. you. There you go. Slides going. There you go. It looks like it should be working. It, it yep. looks, but it. I yep. don't see my slides, do you? We see it. We see your screen. Okay. Do you see just the corner of my screen? Hey, Vicki, <laughs> where's my slides here? Yes, I see your screen. Your slides seem to have gone away. So yeah. if you go down to the PowerPoint, uh, like if at the very bottom, if it's... Yeah, I got my PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There you got you it? Go. Perfect. There Perfect. you go. Well, that was... Smooth. Tech support. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, I enjoyed both of those talks and um, discussing surgery is a very difficult thing and I, I, I can't pretend that I'm going to do it in five minutes. But I'm here to tell you that, uh, as you already know, surgery is the last resort and um, everybody has to have conservative treatment uh, before they have surgery. There's one example of a patient that I just saw today it happened to be a policeman that had a herniated disc that was compressing the uh, cauda equina uh, and uh, developed numbness in his perineum, uh, weakness in both of his legs uh, and an inability to stand and walk. And uh, he also had uh, incontinence of his bowel and bladder. That would be the only emergency or, or one of the most common emergencies that require immediate surgery and that would be called the condition uh, called the Cauticoina syndrome. In any event, um, uh, there are more than 200,000 laminectomies done in the United States every year and amazingly more than 30 percent are failures. And uh, why are, is there such a high failure rate? Well, half of the problem is uh, the patient, uh, meaning that as doctors, we could remove herniated discs and we can uh, unpinch nerves, but we can't make a new spine. And the natural history of degenerative disc disease is one of gradual deterioration of the discs. When that occurs, there are more herniations that, uh, that happen. And the nerves, as the disc space narrows, the nerve openings narrow and there's further compression of the nerves. Half the patient, half of the problem is uh, what I would call doctorogenic, meaning we don't make the right diagnosis, we do the wrong operation, we operate on patients that probably shouldn't have, sur shouldn't have surgery, and sometimes as surgeons we make mistakes in surgery. So um, the purpose uh, of spinal surgery is not to make a mistake, and 30% uh, failure rate is not acceptable. The thing we really have to know is whenever 
anybody uses the word back pain, everybody switches their mind off and you think, well, uh, that's a run of the mill, common everyday back pain. Everybody knows what it is. It's so common. Uh, we don't even have to think about it in terms of diagnosis. But back pain be can be caused by spinal problems. It can be caused by neurological disease, such as uh, neuropathy, multiple sclerosis, ALS. All of those things are non-surgical uh, uh, problems. If you operate on somebody that has uh, ALS or MS by mistake or neuropathy, you're not going to get a good result. Sometimes um, uh, the diagnosis uh, of back pain uh, can be caused by uh, an organ problem. Things like endometriosis, uh, uterine fibroids, bladder infections, uh, appendicitis, pancreatitis, and metastatic cancer, uh, metastatic cancer. All of those things you have to think about when a patient comes in and, uh, and with a diagnosis of, of so-called back pain. The back pain can also be caused by problems with the blood vessels. And I just want to share one case with you um, uh, that will point this out. Another um, a problem that we think about, and when most patients uh, come to see us, there are some patients that walk into your office and the first thing you do is you take your index finger and you go like this. But um, most of the patients actually uh, do not have what I would call psychogenic pain. Um, uh, there are different uh, ways that patients express their pain. There are some patients that embellic, embellish the symptoms, but pure psychogenic pain is uh, uh, very unusual. As a matter of fact, I've only seen one case in like 30 years. This is an example of a, a patient that was admitted to an emergency room in Florida. He woke up one night with severe back pain. He went to the emergency room, they put him on a gurney, he, lied in the, he lay in the emergency room all night complaining of back pain, and the doctor thought, oh well, he's just got you know, run-of-the-mill back pain. The problem was that he had back pain when he went to bed that night when he, when he was laying down. Um, most uh, uh, um, back pain associated with degenerative disc disease is worse with activity and better with rest. This patient's symptoms were the opposite. And indeed, he woke up in the morning, he became um, shocky uh, and was found to have a, um, a ruptured abdominal, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm and the patient died uh, as a result of a poor diagnosis. Now tell me what you want me to This is just a, a patient, that was a patient who had psychogenic pain. This is just a patient who embellishes her symptoms. I just wanna share one more thing with you before I shut up because um, um, uh, uh, we often depend on uh, radiologic diagnosis. Uh, uh, this is a patient, uh, what, what I'm trying to say, what I, what I want to say is we often depend on the radiologist to tell us what's wrong with the patient. We want the radiologist to look at the MRI and we want him to tell us whether the patient needs surgery or not. In fact, um, the way a patient, you, you know whether a patient needs surgery or not is by taking a history and performing a physical examination. This is a, a woman who had a um, psychiatric illness and was not very communicative. Uh, this is a CT scan, and, and this case was done before MRIs became um, prevalent. Uh, the woman was a very poor historian. She could not express exactly what was bothering her. She was actually in an institution, and when she, she was taken to a hospital when the nurse noticed that she was incontinent of her bowel and bladder. This is a CT scan that was read as a normal CT, as a normal uh, 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 X-ray of the spine, when in fact, uh, this patient, when they had an MRI, had a very large herniated disc at L4-5 and had cauda equina syndrome. She was not able to um, relay the symptoms and the doctor didn't take the time to try to talk to her because in fact she was schizophrenic and really couldn't communicate very well. So um, it's very important as a surgeon or any kind of physician to sit down, talk to your patient and uh, determine uh, uh, what the problem actually is by the history and physical. This is a case that is a very typical of a patient who would need surgery. This was the manager of the San Francisco Ballet she was uh, on tour in Tokyo. She couldn't sit, stand, bend, or walk. She had pain in her calf, numbness on the outside of her foot, and on physical examination had an absent Achilles reflex. 
This is the sine qua non of a herniated disc at L5-S1 with compression of the S1 nerve root. This is an MRI scan of the lumbar spine. The sagittal view is on your left. You can see a large extruded disc fragment pressing uh, on uh, what is the S1 nerve root. This is the axial view that shows uh, the dural sac pushed to the side and a large extruded disc compressing and flattening the S1 nerve root. Uh, the story is severe pain. Uh, she had an ex extensive conservative treatment over a year. She had symptoms referable to the S1 nerve root. The MRI confirmed that the S1 nerve root was pinched. And this is a typical case uh, of a patient who would get an excellent result from surgery. The symptoms um, were severe and disabling. She had extensive conservative treatment. Um, the MRI scan matched the findings on the physical examination, and this is the type of patient you really want to operate on. So with that, I think I am going to stop, and um, if there are any questions at the end or anybody wants to ask me anything, I'd be happy to, um, to explain more to you. Um, one other thing that, that doctors, chiropractors, and patients really want to know is um, what is your favorite operation? What operation works the best? Well, it's the operation that addresses the pathological anatomical problem. So I don't have a favorite operation. Um, I look at the pathology. I determine the type of symptoms by the history and physical examination. And then I match the type of operation to the specific uh, uh, patient's problem. And with that, I thank you very much. So Dr. Sharif, I would be, I believe we're going to be handing the floor to you now. Okay, um, I thought maybe I should pick and choose a couple of my slides. So I'm trying, going to try to share the screen uh, because then I'll be the only one without a PowerPoint. So is that okay? Absolutely. All right, I'm just going to try. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Good. All right, I guess I'm supposed to talk about neuro-optometric rehabilitation. And I think the best way to describe that is neurological recovery through visual rehabilitation. And uh, visual rehabilitation has a very profound effect on you know, a person, person's ability to function. Uh, we evaluate several things like how you know you um, gather information, visual acquisition skills, visual processing skills, eye-hand coordination, depth perception, and also your posture, gait, and balance. The reason for that is, I'm going to show you this slide. Every lobe of the brain is involved in visual processing. As you can see, the frontal lobe, eye movement planning, parietal, visual, spatial, map, middle, um, and the, the temporal lobes, object and movement perception, occipital lobe, you all know, um, shape, contrast, and color, and the midbrain is, you know, modifying the eye movements. So when you have a TBI and a brain injury, unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion. Everybody thinks, okay, it's only the occipital lobe, which processes the, you know, the acuity part, or if they have a visual field loss. So um, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on concussion today, but uh, when I do go to see the patients in the hospital in the rehab setting, of course, they do have visual field loss, cranial nerve palsies, you know, dip diplopia and things like that, that need, you know, a little bit more intervention with prisms and lenses and that's in that matter. But in concussion, it's a little bit different, which I think all of you are focusing on. And um, so it's not the physical eyeball or you know, the acuity that is affected in a concussion, it's the visual process. And what do we mean by that? The visual process uh, we consider to be bimodal, it's called focal and ambient vision. The focal vision is the central vision. Sorry, I hope this is not distracting that I'm you know, scrolling through these slides here because I'm just, I wasn't prepared for a, a short uh, uh, slide uh, presentation. Uh, the, so I was talking about the functional vision. We consider that to be bimodal, the focal and the ambient. The focal, of course, is your straight ahead, you know, your clarity, which is usually not affected. 
in a TBI or a concussion is the ambient vision, your peripheral vision that works in conjunction with your other senses and your proprioceptive input in order to allow you to have this you know, foundation, the platform. So if there is a good balance or the ability to be flexible and you know, uh, help each other, then you, know, you can function well. If not, if this, imbalance is, this imbalance can cause compromise in the spatial visual process. And this is critical because if there is no strong foundation with this, the sensory motor system can get fragmented. It affects balance, spatial orientation, posture, movement, and the ability to adapt to environmental changes. And that's when you have these whole host of symptoms that you see what we call post-concussion syndrome symptoms. So vision is dominant, but it must remain plastic in order to support posture. You know, in, you know, if I had more time, of course, I would have shown you that vision does override your sense of you know, hearing, it does override your sense of touch because if, with a faulty vision, you can definitely have, you know, information that that person's gathering is not accurate and correct. And, and that adds to all the other, you know, uh, symptoms that they're having. So a faulty vision impacts posture and a faulty posture long-term impacts vision negatively and can even cause strabismus. So we do have a couple of syndromes that we um, you know, evaluate. It's called the visual midline shift syndrome. And I probably need to show you some slides on that one because that is uh, probably gonna be a little helpful. So this is very real. We evaluate their spatial vision and it's unbelievable how accurate it is in terms of like a, say a stroke patient and then they're walking they're kind of veering off to one side. So we can actually test that and we can uh, reorient it with our magic tools that we call yoked prisms. So that is you know, really helpful for these people to reorient their balance and their posture. And of course the post-trauma vision syndrome, you know, again, is a whole host of symptoms in terms of convergence issues, in terms of how they are having tunnel vision, how they cannot sustain attention, focus, all of you probably are familiar with the checklist, the post-concussion syndrome checklist, um, that 80% of that checklist you know, is involved in some form or fashion with visual deficits that can be addressed be because vision is our dominant sense. It's like a big keyboard to the brain and we can influence you know, brain, the brain and its ability to improve you know, the functional process. So some of the symptoms can include problems such as headaches, light sensitivity, spatial disorientation, balance problems, vertigo, nausea, tracking problems, focus, sustained attention, blurred vision, bothered by movement of objects or text, visual memory problems. All of these actually can be addressed. And um, one of the big, of course, we have sensitive tools to measure like VEP, visually evoked attentions and a balance test. And what our intervention tools are, we can actually you know, look at it and, and be able to be a little bit more precise in terms of how it's impacting that person and how they're able to maintain their balance. One of the most important things I guess I wanna share today is, um, I'm not sure if everyone's heard of this, but it's the concussion screening tool that is the standard in the industry today, anywhere, on the sidelines, on the field. I mean, people who are um, you know, suspected to have a concussion, they're pulled and they're administered the bombs. And over 95% of this test has to do with eye movements. So basically, your eye movements are now considered windows to brain health. So Basically, you're evaluating pursuits, saccades, vertical saccades, near point of convergence. You're evaluating accommodation. You're evaluating VOR, sorry, and visual motion sensitivity. So the last two has a little bit of a component of the vestibular. And um, all that they're doing is as they are having the person do these um, you know, saccadic activities, they're just waiting and asking, it's like a provocative test, and they're asking to grade headache, dizziness, nausea, and fogginess. There's a protocol that you follow. It's extremely simple. It may take about five to 10 minutes to administer, 
but this is the standard, gold standard right now. I think it came out of University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania somewhere. And by the way, this is available on Google online. You could Google bombs, vestibular ocular mo mo movement um, test. So uh, it's very, very, very revealing. If somebody does have a concussion, they will show positive on this. So it's research-based and this is something that's, that's been used. So this is a great test to screen for visual deficits, which by itself, you know, are very subtle and people only think about acuity, people think about the eyeball. I mean, I got, I saw a patient yesterday and something fell in her eye and people, sometimes I get these, you know, patients coming in, but a lot of them come because of course they've had a concussion and they've had a whiplash injury and everything's been done, but they have these really persistent symptoms and headaches and, and light sensitivity and unable to sustain near work and they're, un, you know, they're unable to focus, they're, they're unable to function and they're, and they're crying and they're man, managers and people think that they're malingering or, or they're just making things up. And so when we test them and, and now they can see for themselves, our sensitive tests are actually showing them what really is going on. They actually cry, you know, in my chair, they, somebody finally believes me or knows what's going on. So um, overall, you know, but basically what I wanted to say is vision, people think it's acuity and eyeball health, but that's not what's affected in a TBI or a concussion. It's everything else, tracking, focusing, processing, you know, your gait, your balance, you know, double vision, blurred vision, intermittent suppression of the eye. There's a whole host of things. Visual memory, you can't, you know, retain, you know, um, information. So. It's just the visual um, screening tool, the post-concussion syndrome, I think really tells it all also. So that's a great way, and the WOMS. I hope you guys get a chance to watch WOMS on Google. So okay. that's all I have to say. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Doc. And I think this is so valuable for a lot of chiropractors because there are a lot of times the first point of contact before anyone else has had a chance to evaluate the patient and right after a motor vehicle accident or slip and fall, things like that, it is important for us to be able to, we always do consider and do mini cranial exams, but this VOMS is going to be so helpful. I was, I'm glad that, so you said you can find that on Google? You can just Google it. You'll find plenty of YouTube videos and information on it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and type in your questions into our Q&A section. And all of the doctors are available for my segment. Obviously, any questions for pain management, I will forward it to Dr. Kevin Trent or Dr. Dennis Yoon, and I will email you back any answers that they have for you. And Nicole, is there anything else? At this I, think, point. I think that's it, unless anybody has any questions, like we said, to just put them in the Q&A along with your email address. Um, I'll give everybody, you know, a minute or so to do that. Um, but if not, then thank you all so much for attending. Thank you, doctors, for being on this discussion. We really appreciate it. And thank you to Injury Institute for the coordination of all of this and for being the presenter today as well. It was great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Let's see. Oh. <laughs>